one of the things you work on and write about is dark matter. We can't see it, but there's a lot of it in the universe. Uh, you also end one of your books with a Beatles song quote, got to be good looking because he's so hard to see. <laughs> <laughs> what is dark matter? How should we think about it, given that we can't see it? How should we visualize it in our mind's eye? I think one of the really important things that physics teaches you is just our limitations, but also our abilities. So the fact that we can deduce the existence of something that we don't directly see is really a tribute to people that we can do that. But it's also something that tells you you can't overly rely on your direct senses. If you just relied on just what you see directly, you would miss so much of what's happening in the world. Mm. And we can generalize this, but we're just for now to focus on dark matter. It's something we know is there. And it's not just one way we know it's there. In my book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, I talk about the many different ways, you know, there's eight or nine that we we deduce not just the existence of dark matter, but how much how much is there. And they all agree. Now, how do we know it's there? Because of its gravitational force. And individually, a particle doesn't have such a big gravitational force. In fact, gravity is an extremely weak force compared to other forces we know about in nature. But there's a lot of dark matter out there. It carries a lot of energy, five times the amount of energy as the matter we know that's in atoms, etc. So you can ask, how should we think about it? Well, it's just another form of matter that doesn't interact with light, or at least as far as we know. So it interacts gravitationally, it clumps, it forms galaxies, but it doesn't interact with light, which means we just don't see it. And most of our detection before gravitational wave detectors, we only saw things because of their interactions with light in some sense. So in theory, it, it behaves just like any other matter, Just it just doesn't interact with light. So when we say it interacts just like any other form of matter, we have to be careful um, because gravitationally, it interacts like other forms of matter but it doesn't experience electromagnetism, which is why it has a different distribution. So in our galaxy, it's roughly spherical, uh, un unless it has its own interactions, that's another story. But we, we know that it's roughly spherical, um, whereas ordinary matter can radiate and clumps into a disk. And that's why we see the Milky Way disk. So on large scales, in some sense, yes, all the matter is similar in some sense. In fact, dark matter, is in some sense more important because it can collapse more readily than ordinary matter because ordinary matter has, has radiative forces, which makes it hard to collapse on small scales. So actually it's dark matter that sort of drives um, galaxy formation and then ordinary matter kind of comes along with it. Um, and there's also just more of it. And because there's more of it, it can start collapsing sooner. That is to say the energy density in dark matter dominates over radiation earlier than you would if you just had ordinary matter. So it's part of the story of the origin of a galaxy, part of the story of the end of the galaxy, and part of the story of yeah, all the various interactions throughout. Exactly. I mean, in my book, I make kind of sort of jokes about, you know, it's like when we think about a building, we think about the architect, we think about, you know, the high level, but we forget about all the workers that did all the grunt work. And in fact, dark matter was really important in the formation of our universe, and we forget that sometimes. So that's a, a metaphor on top of a metaphor. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the unheard voices that do the actual work. Okay. Exactly. No, but it is a metaphor, but it also captures something, because the fact is we don't directly see it, so we forget it, it's there, or we don't understand it's there, or we think it's not. The fact that we don't see it makes it no less legitimate. It just means that we have challenges in order to find out exactly what it is. Yeah, but the things we cannot see that nevertheless have uh, gravitational interaction with the things we can't see is at the uh, layman level is just mind blowing, you know? It is and it isn't because I think what it's teaching us is that we're human, the universe is what it is. And we're trying to interact with that universe and, and discover what it is. We've discovered amazing things. In fact, I would say it's more surprising that the, mount, the matter that we know about is constitutes as big a fraction of the universe as it does. I mean, mm -hmm. we're limited. We're human. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we see 5% of the energy density of the universe, um, you know, about one-sixth of the energy density in matter, that's kind of remarkable. I mean, why should that be? 
there could be anything out, anything could be out there. Yet the universe that we see is a significant fraction. Yeah, but a lot of our intuition, I think, operates using visualizations in the mind. That's and absolutely true. And it's certainly writing books, I realized, also how many of our words are based on how we see the world. Um, and that's true. And that's actually one of the fantastic things about physics is that it teaches you how to go beyond your immediate intuition to get, develop intuitions that apply at different distances, different scales, different ways of thinking about things. Yeah, how do you anthropomorphize dark matter? <laughs> how do, I just did, I think. I made it the grunt work, workers. Oh yeah, that's good, yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, that's why you get paid the big bucks with a, and write the great books. Okay, so um, you also write in that book about uh, dark matter, matter having to do something with the extinction events, the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, which is kind of a fascinating presentation of how everything is connected. So I guess the disturbances from the dark matter, they create gravitational disturbances in the Oort cloud at the edge of our solar system, and then that increases the rate of asteroids hitting Earth. So I want to be really clear, this was a speculative theory. Mm -hmm. I um, love it, though. <laughs> I mean, and I liked it, too. And, um, and we still don't know for sure, but we can, what we liked about it, so let me take a step back. So we usually assume that dark matter is what, we being physicists, that it's just one thing. It's just basically non-interacting, in, aside from gravity, or very weakly interacting matter. Um, but again, we have to get outside this mindset of just humans and ask, what else could be there? And so what we suggested is that there's a fraction of dark matter, not all the dark matter, but some of the dark matter, maybe it has interactions of its own. Just the same way in, in our universe, we have lots of different types of matter. We have nuclei, we have electrons, we have muons, we, we have forces. Um, we have lots of, it's, it's not a simple model, the standard model, but, but it does have some basic ingredients. So maybe dark matter also has some interesting um, structure to it. So maybe there's some small fraction. And the interesting thing is that if some of the dark matter does radiate, and you know, I like to call it dark light because it's light that we don't see, but dark matter would see, it could radiate that, and then it could perhaps collapse into a disk the same way ordinary matter collapsed in the mix, into the Milky Way disk. So it's not all the dark matter, it's a fraction. But it could conceivably be a very thin disk of dark matter, a thin, dense disk of dark matter. And so then the question is, do these exist? And People have done studies now to think about whether they can find them. I mean, it's an interesting target. It's something you can measure. By measuring the positions and velocities of stars, you can find out what the structure of the, of the Milky Way is. Um, but the fun proposal was that the solar system orbits around the galaxy. And as it does so, it goes a little bit up and down, kind of like horses on a carousel. And the suggestion was every time it goes through, you have an enhanced probability that you would dislodge something from the edge of the solar system mm -hmm. in something called the Oort cloud. So the idea was that at those times, you're more likely to have these cataclysmic events, such as the amazing one that actually caused the last extinction that we know of for sure. It wasn't so amazing for the dinosaurs. Or for two thirds of the species on the planet. Yeah, it's, but as it gets amazing for humans, it wouldn't be. What, what really is amazing, I mean, I, I do, I mean, I talk about this in Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs. I, it's just an amazing scientific story because it really is one of the real stories that combine together different fields of science. Geologists at the time, or you know, people thought that things happened slowly and this would be a cataclysmic event. And also I have to say, you know, if you, if you think about it, it sounds like a story like a five-year-old would make up. Mm -hmm. Maybe the dinosaurs were killed by some big mm -hmm. rock that came yeah. and hit the earth, but then there really was a scientific story behind it. And that's also why I like the dark disk because there's a scientific story behind it. So as far-fetched as it might sound, you could actually go and look for the experimental consequences or the observational consequences to test whether it's true. I wish you could know like high resolution details of where that asteroid came from, like where in the Oort cloud, why it happened, is it in fact because of dark matter? It's like the full tracing back to the origin of the universe. Because humans seem to be somewhat special, but it just, it seems like so many fascinating events at all scales, at all scales of physics had to happen for- So I'm comfort. really, really glad you mentioned that because actually that was one of the main points of my book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs. One of the reasons I wrote it was because 
I really think we are abusing the planet. We're changing the planet way too quickly. And just like anything else, when you alter things, it's good to think about the history of what it took to get here. And it, and as you point out, it took many operations on many different scales. You know, we had to have the formation of, of structure, the formation of galaxies, the formation of the solar system, the formation of our planet, the formation of humans. I mean, there's so many steps that go into this. And humans, in some part, were the result of the fact that this big object hit the earth, made the dinosaurs go extinct, and mammals developed. I mean, it is an incredible story. And <laughs> yes, something else might come of it, but it won't be us if we mess with it too much. But it is on a grand scale. Earth is a pretty resilient system. Uh, c can you just clarify, just fascinating, uh, the shape of things? So the shape of the Milky Way is of the observable stuff is mostly flat. And then you said dark matter tends to be spherical, but a subset of that might be a flat disk. So you want to hear about the shape of things. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. So structure formed early on, and now our structure that we live in is, so we know about the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. So the Milky Way galaxy has the disk you can see in a dry, dark place. That's where stars and light is. But you can also measure, in some ways, the dark matter. And we believe that dark matter is more or less spherically distributed. Um, and like we said, there's a lot of it. Not necessarily in the disk, but just because it's a sphere, there's a lot of it sitting there. And the reason it doesn't collapse as far as we know, is that it doesn't really, it can't radiate the same way. So because it can radiate, ordinary matter collapses. And it's actually, because of conservation of angular momentum, it, it stays a disk and it doesn't just collapse to the center. So our suggestion was that maybe there are some components of dark matter that also radiate. Like I said, that's far from proven. People have looked for disks. They see some evidence of some disks of certain densities. But I see. these are all questions that are worth asking. Basically, if we can figure it out from existing measurements, why not try? Okay, so there's not all dark matter is made the same. This is well, that's a possibility. Right. We actually don't know what dark matter is in the first place. We don't know what most of it is. We don't know what a fraction is. I mean, it's hard to measure. Why is it hard to measure? For exactly the reason you said earlier, we don't see it. So we want to think of possibilities for what it can be, if especially if those give rise to some observational consequences. I mean, it's it's a tough game because it's not something that's just there for the taking. You have to think about what it could be and how you might find it. And the way you detect it is gravitational effects on things we can see. That would be the way you detect the type of dark matter I've been talking about. People have suggestions for other forms of dark matter. They could be particles called axions. They could be other types of particles. And then there are different ways of detecting it. I mean, the most popular candidate for dark matter, probably until pretty recently because they haven't found it, is something called WIMPs, weakly interacting mass of particles, um, particles that have mass about the same as the Higgs boson mass. Um, and it turns out then you would get the, about the right density of dark matter. But then b people really like that, of course, because it is connected to the standard model, the particles that we know about. And if it's connected to that, we have a better chance of actually seeing it. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's also a better chance that you can rule it out because you can look for it. And so far, no one has found it. We're still looking for it. Is that one of the hopes of the Large Hadron Collider? That was originally one of the hopes of the Large Hadron Collider. I'd say at this point, it would be very unlikely given what they've already accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, but there are these um, underground detectors, xenon detectors that look for dark matter coming in. And they they are going to try to achieve a, a much stronger bound than it exists today. Just uh, take that tangent. Looking back now, what's the biggest to you insight uh, to humanity that the LHC has been able to provide? It's interesting. It's both um, a major victory. Um, the Higgs boson was proposed 50 years ago and it was discovered. The Higgs mechanism seemed to be the only way to explain elementary particle masses and it was right. So on the one hand, it was a major victory. On the other hand, I've been in physics long enough to know it was also a cautionary tale in some sense, because um, at the time I started out in physics, we had some, proposed something in the United States called the superconducting supercollider. A lot of physicists, I'll say particularly in Europe, but I'd say a lot of physicists, were sanguine that the Large Hadron Collider would have the energy reach necessary 
to discover what underlies the standard model. We don't want to just discover the standard model. We want to know what the next step is. Mm -hmm. And I think here, um, people were more cautious about that. They wanted to have a more comprehensive search that could get to higher energies, um, more events, so that we could, you know, we could really more definitively rule it out. Mm -hmm. But in that case, many people thought they knew what would be there. It would happen to be a theory called supersymmetry. So a lot of physicists thought it would be supersymmetry. I mean, it's one of the many factors, I think, that went into the fact that the Large Hadron Collider became the only machine in town. And um, the superconducting supercollider would have just been a much, if it had really had achieved what it was supposed to, would have been a much more robust test of, of the space. Mm -hmm. so, so I'd say for humanity, it's both a tribute to the ability of discovery and the ability of really believing in things so that you have the confidence to go look for them. But it's also a cautionary tale that you don't want to, you know, assume things before they've been actually found. So you want to do things in, you know, you, you want to believe in your theories, but you also want to question them at the same time in ways that you're more likely to discover the truth. But it's also an illustration of grand engineering efforts that humanity can take on and uh, maybe a lesson that you could go even bigger. <laughs> um, I, I'm really glad you said that though too, because that that's absolutely true. I mean, it's it really is an impressive it's it's impressive in so many ways. It's impressive technologically. It's impressive at an engineering level. It's also impressive that so many countries work together um, to to do this. It wasn't just one country, and how it was. It was also impressive in that it was a long term project that people committed to and made it happen. So it is a demonstration that when people set their minds to things and they commit to it, that they can do something amazing. But also in the United States, uh, maybe a lesson that bureaucracy can slow things down. To what bureaucracy and, and politics. Politics. And economics. Many, many things can make them faster and make them slower. So science is the way to make progress. Politics is the way to slow that progress down. And um, here we Well, go. I don't want to overstate <laughs> that because without politics, the, yeah. you know, the LAC no, wouldn't need happen it. either. So, yeah. um, but. <laughs> you need broccoli. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I do think, I mean, you're not asking this question, but sometimes I do think when I, you know, think about some of these conflicts, you know, sometimes it's just good to have a project that people work on together. And there were some efforts to do that with in science too, to have Palestinians and Israelis work together, a project called Sesame. Um, I think it's not a bad idea when you can do that, um, when you can get, you know, uh, sort of for, forget the politics and just focus on some particular project, sometimes that can work. Some kind of forcing function, some kind of deadline that gets people to sit in a room together and you're working on a thing, but as part of that, you realize the common humanity, that you all have the same concerns, the same hopes, the same fears, the same, that you are all human. And that's an accidental side effect of working together on a thing. I, that's absolutely true. And it's one of the reasons CERN was formed, actually. It was post-World War II, and a lot of European physicists had actually left Europe, and they wanted to see Europeans work together and, and sort of rebuild. And and it worked. I mean, they, they did. And it's true. I, I often think that, that, you know, one of the major problems is we just don't meet enough people so that everyone thinks seems like, when they seem like the other, it's more easy to forget their humanity. So I think it, it is important to have these connections.